Today, the 24th, the last Sunday of Pentecost, in Bayberry County, Kentucky. In the epistle, or the 24th and last Sunday of Pentecost, this year, 25 Sundays after Pentecost Sunday. It's taken from St. Paul's letter to Colossians chapter 1. Brethren, we have been praying for you unceasingly, asking that you may be filled with knowledge of God's will. In all spiritual wisdom and understanding, may you walk worthily of God and please him in all things, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. May you be completely strengthened through his glorious power and through perfect patience and long suffering, joyfully rendering thanks to God, the Father, who has made us worthy to share the lot of the saints in light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have our redemption through his blood, the remission of sins. In the gospel, take that according to St. Matthew, chapter 24. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, When you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let him who reads understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything from his house. And let him who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. But woe to those who are with child or have infants at breast at the breast in those days. But pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, nor shall be. And unless those days have been shortened, no living creature would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days shall be shortened. Then anyone say to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or well, there he is. Do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise, and will show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told it to you beforehand. If therefore they say to you, Behold, he is in the desert, do not go forth. Behold, he is in the closet, and believe it not. For as the lightning comes from the forth from the east and shines even unto the west, so also will the coming of man, the Son of Man, be. Wherever the body is, there will the eagles also be gathered together. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon will not give her light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then will all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming upon the clouds of heaven with great power and majesty. And he will send forth his angels with a trumpet and a great sound, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens unto the other. For now from the fig tree learn this parable. When, it, when its branch is now tender, and the leaves break forth, you know that summer is nigh. Even so, when you shall see all these things, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. Amen, amen, I say unto you, amen, I say to you, this generation shall not pass away. To all these things have been accomplished. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Those are the words of today's Holy Gospel. The name of the Father, the Son, the Ghost, Amen. Today on this 24th Sunday after Pentecost, <clears throat> first of all, I mentioned briefly one of the subtle evils of the Vatican II is that on this day is a day in which they celebrate the Feast of Christ the King. When today is properly the day of a most important feast in our church, that is the Day of Judgment. And that the Feast of Christ the King is celebrated now in the modernist church because it gives the idea that Jesus Christ, he is indeed King. But he is not to rule in his kingship until the ending of the world. And that his kingship is more in the heavens when he shall call together from the four winds all of the elect. But our Lord Jesus Christ rules in this world. He is a king right now. 
He has been the king from the beginning of time and shall remain the king in this world until the ending of times. But at the end of times, he shall come as a judge. And today we consider the coming of the judgment. In one of the 12 articles of the creed, we are all going to experience judgment. Every one of us is going to be judged. And the judge is our Lord Jesus Christ. The same God who is most merciful to us in this life, the same God who pours out his infinite love upon us right now in order that we might turn away from sin and come back to God, come back to justice that was taken away by the original sin of Adam. He wants us to come back to justice, but the time will come when he says, Satis. The time will come when he says, Enough. The time will come when he says, it is now time to render an account of your stewardship, for thou canst be steward no longer. Now what is interesting about this stewardship, render an account of thy stewardship, thou shalt be steward no longer. It is not only said to the unjust steward, it shall also be said to the just steward. St. Pius X had to render an account of his stewardship. He was the head of our Holy Church, the Vicar of Christ, from 1903 to 1914. And when he died, he had to render an account of his stewardship. And he was one of the holiest and greatest stewards our church has ever known. Not only shall the unjust render an account of their stewardship, but the just shall also render an account. And not only shall individuals render an account, but the nation shall render an account. There is going to come a time when there must be a judgment. For God is perfect and God is God. And God made this world good. And when it ends, it shall be good again. And all that which is not good shall be eradicated and removed. All that has been touched by evil shall be completely cleansed of evil. And that which remains evil shall be put away in the kingdom of hell. And this judgment is coming upon all. And the sacred scripture tells us, consider your judgment, consider your death, and you will never sin. We must consider from time to time this holy judgment. And today we consider this sacred judgment that is going to come upon all of us. And as Bishop Sheen used to say, what is it that makes a man despair? Dogs don't despair. Cows don't despair. No animal despairs. And why is it? Very simply because they are not eternal. They are not made for eternity. It's no sad thing when a dog dies or when a cow dies. They have lived their life. They have done their work for God. They have done their part in the universe, and then they cease to exist. But human beings are made for something more. And our bodies shall for a brief time, for the smallest amount of time, the very first man to die was Abel. He was the very first human being to go to judgment. And we can surmise at the ending of the world, the very last one to die shall also be like unto Abel, shall be a priest of God as Abel was, and shall be the last one to go to judgment. And as Abel went to judgment, the very first man to be judged, he was a saint. So likewise, most likely at the end of times, the very last man to die at the very end of the world shall be as pure and clean as Abel and shall go to judgment. Abel was the first one to meet the judge. The day that he met the judge, he was simply watching sheep. The day that he met the judge, he had no problems of health. And he had no idea that he was going to meet the judge. St. Alphonsus speaks about this and he says, Remember, even amongst the saints, it is very rare that they know the time of their own death. God does reveal to some of the saints the time that they shall come to judgment. But the saint does not know the day or the hour. Most of them. Only a few are given the grace. And a few are given the grace to show that the knowledge and power of God that he can do whoever, to reveal to whomever he wishes the day of the judgment. Abel was just watching his sheep on the day that he was judged. Abel saw no difficulty or no day, no, no problem, and no, no warning of any kind of trouble. Cain came to meet him 
and Cain murdered Abel. What is the cause of judgment? What brought Abel to judgment? The sin of Cain brought him to death. And Abel was, blood was in the ground. And what do we say about that first judgment that happened? God came down to Cain and he said, where is thy brother? And what did Cain say? Am I my brother's keeper? And every man that lives in sin, and every man that is afraid of the judgment, will always say the same thing. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I responsible for my brother? I'm responsible only for my own soul. I'm taking care of my farm. Abel is taking care of his sheep. I don't know where Abel is. And then what does God say to Cain about that? Uh, the blood of Abel cried to heaven. The blood of Abel is in the field, and it cries to heaven. And what does the blood of Abel cry for? Vengeance. So there are two sides of judgment. On the one side of judgment, there are those that die like Abel. And what was Abel doing? He was simply doing his duty. And from that day forward, what are the priests of God supposed to tell souls? As St. Alphonse used to say, do you live a number of years as St. Alphonsus? No, you don't live a number of years. You live a number of graces. And when, what grace shall be your last? You shall accept it and go to judgment, or you shall reject it and go to judgment. You live a number of sins, and God alone knows the number, and you shall commit it and go to judgment or you shall not, and go to judgment. No man lives a number of years on this life. All of us, no matter how young we are, know someone that has gone to judgment younger than us. Abel went to judgment. When Abel went to judgment, he was simply doing his duty. He was living his normal daily life. He was not thinking of death. He was just living as a priest of God. He was just taking care of the sheep. He was just watching them in the fields. He was having another ordinary day in which he knew love and served God as a priest of God. Cain came to visit him, and he was happy to see his brother Cain. But then Cain demonstrated that he was not coming in, in brotherhood or friendship, but to murder him. We know not the day or the hour of our judgment, and we know not the day or the hour of the judgment of our country, and we know not the day or the hour of the judgment of our world. We do know something of the circumstances. We know something of the situation. But Abel went to the judgment, and what happened when Abel went to judgment? It called for vengeance. This is another teaching of our church. In fact, this teaching of our church during the beginning stages of spiritual life was actually a great comfort to St. Teresa, the child Jesus, and many other saints. She said, when I was young in the supernatural life, it was a judgment that gave me comfort. For I was so often wronged, so often mistreated and maligned, and that no one knew about it, but I would think of the judgment on the day of judgment, they shall know. On the day of judgment, it shall be known to all that I was innocent. And this is a dogma of our faith and a reality of life. One of the reasons why we should not worry too much when we are maligned and cursed. What does the Lord Jesus Christ say about this judgment? There are two sides of the judgment of my being cursed as a Catholic and follower of God. It is the eighth beatitude when our Lord says, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and curse you for my name's sake, for your reward is great indeed in heaven. Every curse is counted by God. Our Lord Jesus Christ received many sufferings when he was upon the cross. He noted every one of them. He heard every curse, he heard every mockery, he felt every blow. And those that did not repent, as he died in his priesthood, like Abel died in his priesthood, 
The blood of Jesus Christ, like unto the blood of Abel, calls for vengeance. And what does it say also in the sacred scripture? Vengeance is mine, I shall repay. And this is a dogma of our faith and a reality of life and what causes the sinner to despair. For the sinner knows God shall repay. He shall repay the impurities. He shall repay the injustice in his business. He shall repay the lies. He shall repay the evil words and the destruction of others. He shall repay the pride. He shall repay every single assault, both great and small. It also is made very clear in sacred scripture. The justice of God grinds exceeding small. There shall be vengeance. And this is one of the comforts of the just. David speaks about it multiple times in the Psalms. He says, the just man shall wipe his feet in the blood of sinners. And God says that when that shall come upon you, I shall mock when that comes upon you, which you feared. What is it that the sinner fears? He fears the judgment. Why do people have to take medication? Why do they have to take drugs? Why do they have to try to take sleeping pills? Why do they have to keep their TV on all the time? Keep their cell phone going all the time? Why do they have to keep running around and being busy? Because the majority of souls know with certainty that they are in mortal sin. Anna, a soul who went to hell in 1937 in Germany at the age of 27, she said to her friend Clara, she was obliged to appear to after death. One of the priests said in a sermon that no man goes to hell without knowing it. And this is true. For though I never thought of God, the day that Anna died at the age of 27 went to judgment, she did not know that she was going to go to judgment. And by today's standards, she was a very good girl. She was only married once. She never once committed the sin of fornication before her marriage. She was married for only a year, but God was not the center of her marriage. Her and her husband, Max, they wanted to have a good time and live by the world. Sunday was not a day of going to Mass in southern Germany where they lived. It was a day of recreation. And she said on the final day of her life, there came a temptation. It was her final temptation. And she called it a temptation. She woke up in the morning that Sunday, not knowing it was a day of her judgment, not officially knowing. And she heard a voice say inside of her, you could go to Mass. That was her final temptation from God. You could go to Mass. But then she looked out at the weather and said, this is a very nice day. As we've seen quotes in the book of Genesis, it says in the book of Genesis, on the day of the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah, when the sun rose that morning, it was bright. It was another day for a Sodomite. Another day for a Gamorite. Just another day. Nothing special except it was a nice day. And it was a day of fire and brimstone and the day of judgment. So Anna said, I had a temptation. You could go to Mass. And it felt so strong. Maybe I should go. But no, it's a beautiful day. And Max and I have decided to go for a picnic. We'll go to Mass on a day when it's raining. The day we go to the picnic. And so they went to the picnic. And that night when they came back from the picnic... Driving in the nighttime, headlights of an ongoing car distracted her husband. He couldn't see. And she drove, he drove straight into a tree, and she was killed. And she went to judgment and was damned for all eternity. And she now burns in hell. And she shall burn in hell forever. And by today's standards, she was a pretty good girl. She did not know that it was a day of judgment she worshipped only pleasure. She worshipped only business and the things of this life. And she just didn't go to Mass on Sunday. And she only had one husband. And she is damned in hell. She didn't know it was a day of judgment. Abel did not know it was a day of judgment. 
But when she went before God, she saw her life as it really is. She saw all the movements of grace throughout her life. She saw the opportunities. She said, you know, Clara, the priest said in the sermon that no man goes to hell who doesn't have a knowledge that he's going to go to hell. And it is true. For I began to experience the presence of the devil that now bothers me several years before death. Here we note concerning modern people. Many people believe that they are possessed of the devil. They're not possessed of the devil. They're just living in mortal sin, and their devil is communicating to them as is normal. Anna heard several times a voice. One time the voice of Satan said to her, the devil that was tormenting her in hell now, and is now tormenting her now after she's been dead for 80 years, about her father who lived in mortal sin, and her father was a drunk, and her father was dying. And taught me she might, he might die that night. And it was not the voice of God that spoke to her. It was the voice of the devil. And the devil said to her, what will happen to your father if he dies? What will happen to him if he dies tonight? She didn't even use the word hell. It all is too bad for him. What will happen to your father? He won't die. But it's too bad for him. And he won't die. And he won't die. And he won't die. And she even hated her father. But why did she not want him to die? Because she knew that he was going to hell when he died. And she knew that, he, that she was like unto her father. And that she was also on the path to hell. There are many souls today that say they hear spirits and they hear, hear sounds and they feel negative things. Usually it's nothing. Sometimes it is a true case of possession. This is very rare. Most of the time it's just your guardian devil talking to you and mocking you in preparation for eternal damnation and judgment. She didn't like to see the churches. She didn't like to hear sermons on hell or judgment. She didn't like she was agitated when she heard many of these things, and she always turned to criticism whenever something negative came up about the soul that is not the friend of God. And on that day that she died, she did not know she was going to judgment, but God gave her a grace of salvation, which she called the temptation, and she rejected it. Abel did not know that he was going to go to judgment. But God gave him the grace to simply do his duty. And so he did it. And he died and went to judgment. And St. Alphonse says, consider the death of the saints. There are saints that have died in their sleep. One saint, he says, was struck by lightning and died by the striking of lightning. <coughs> they have died in the oldest of age. They have died in the youngest of age. They have died in the picked perfect health. They have died of great disease over a long period of time. And they have died in every kind of situation, not only being martyred. Because God wanted to make it clear to the saints, you know not the day or the hour of judgment, but you are being prepared for judgment. And all decisions we make are in preparation for this judgment. Now the one judgment is the judgment of thou hast done well, good and faithful servant. Come into the joy of the Lord. And the other judgment is, depart from me, ye cursed everlasting fire. And as we travel through life, we are preparing for a judgment. And we know this. The man that calls himself an atheist knows he's going to be judged. The man that says he doesn't believe in religion knows he's going to be judged. That's why he has to go to modern universities to fill his brain with crap so that he can believe the garbage that they tell him in order to cover his conscience. That's why he has to always have his TV on and always be surrounded by noise to try to cover his conscience because he knows that in silence his conscience speaks and sometimes his guardian devil will speak to him as the devil spoke to Anna in Germany and sometimes his guardian angel will speak to him and call him back to repentance. But as St. Alphonse said, who promised you a long life? Who promised you this night? Prepare for judgment. And now is the time to prepare for that judgment. Now when it comes to the judgment of the world, 
Our Lord Jesus Christ tells us the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 24, some of the signs of the preparation of the judgment. And one of the signs is the abomination of desolations in the holy place. You shall see the abomination, which is false worship and idolatry, of desolation in the holy place. Now, there are several abominations. The first one is the idolatry that shall happen at the end of the world when we are required to worship the beast, to worship the Antichrist as though he is God. And all be required to do that. And this shall be the abomination, and it shall take place in the holy place. The abomination is also the false worship in the house of God, such as the Nova Sorda Mise, the new mass is the abomination of desolation in the holy place. And the abomination is also recorded to by Anne Catherine Emmerich when she described her vision of church at the end of times. She saw a vision of church, Anne Catherine Emmerich did. Now, the priest, he was nothing in the front of the church. He was just reading a few kind of lame prayers. And the church was not full. There were only some people here and there throughout the church. And the people came into the church and when they knelt down to pray, there was no God for them to worship in the sanctuary. They didn't worship God, but they came to church to worship a God, and each person brought his own God to church. <clears throat> now, some pulled out statues that were made of gold. Others pulled out statues made of brass, others of wood. Some pulled out little monsters. Some pulled out great beasts. Some pulled out sickly and dead, sickly and almost dead things. And they all, each one brought their own idol to church. St. Augustine tells us the abomination is idolatry, and idolatry happening in the church. Now, the first idolatry is the one that is referred to in the time of the Antichrist, but there's another idolatry, which is the idolatry of Catholics, whose God is their belly, whose center is something other than God. They come to church to pray for God business, to pray for pleasure, to pray for something to keep them happy. And oftentimes, they're nothing of any great value. And this is an abomination. And Anchor the Nimic saw the abomination of desolation in the holy place towards the end of times that each person would come to church with their own God. I got my own God, and I'm bringing my God to church. B-Y-O-G, bring your own God. And they came to church and brought their own God. They didn't come to church to worship God. They didn't come to church in order to pray to God, to repent of their sins, or to worship God, even another false God. Each man has his own God. We are now in that age right now, and the abomination of desolation is not even the great abomination of the Antichrist. It is a weak, worthless abomination of the goals of men today who don't even have even the goal to be a multimillionaire or the goal to, to have the greatest of pleasure and the greatest of fame and the greatest of glory. They are the most wimpy of goals. And Anchor then makes all this. This is the abomination, and it is a desolation because the true church is going to be made desolate. It's going to be ripped apart. It's going to be made empty of statues. It's going to be empty of the presence of Christ. It's going to be empty of the holy and true sacrifice. It will be a desolate and destroyed place like the, like the temple was when Judas Maccabeus came to purify it on December 25th in the year 153 AD BC. He saw the temple was grown up in weeds and it was desolate. It was desolate and destroyed. The abomination of desolation is one of the signs that we are getting close to the judgment. And we're now in a time where the abomination of desolation is everywhere all around us. There shall be a judgment. And we are to be reminded that the two sides of judgment, those that are innocent, they shall come to the joy of the Lord. And those that are guilty, the innocent shall watch them be beaten, watch them be thrown into fire. And it says in the sacred scripture in the book of wisdom, and the innocent shall see and shall laugh. Only time is mentioned about laughter in sacred scripture. The innocent shall see and shall laugh. But the, 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 or the children shall see and shall laugh, but the innocent shall mock, shall laugh them to scorn. Shall see and shall mock, but the innocent shall laugh them to scorn. The just shall see and shall mock, but the innocent shall laugh them, laugh them to scorn. That's what it says in the book of wisdom. Here it is indicated as St. Augustine. <coughs> in heaven, there shall be a mockery of the damned. 
And this is part of the judgment. The devils and the, those who live in the state of mortal sin are not only going to be judged by God and cast into hell, but all the just shall laugh at them, shall mock them. And notice how it says this, like St. Augustine, the just shall mock but the innocent shall laugh, shall laugh to scorn. In other words, the more innocent and the more holy a soul is in heaven, the more rejoicing shall be the souls of the just over the damned. Because one of the questions of many people is, what shall the judgment be like? When you find out that all these millions of people are being judged by God, shall we say, oh, those poor people, I am so sorry that they made bad decisions. I am so sorry that they've gone to judgment. No. Those that are just shall, shall mock the damned. When the souls are in heaven, they shall repeat the judgment upon the damned. And they shall mock them as they look down into hell. And there shall not be the drop of sorrow. And the more innocent and more holy a saint is in heaven, the greater shall be his laughter the greater shall be his mockery of the damned. And this mockery shall last forever. And this laughter shall last forever. And as it is to be reminded of the saints that they mock us for a time in this life. But that time comes to an end. This is why sacred scripture in the Gospel of St. John, as Bishop Sheen points out, quoting St. Augustine, that where evil is always referred to as an hour, whereas justice is referred to as a day. There is only a brief time of sin. Abel has been at judgment. He was judged 5,000, almost 6,000 years ago. And he is a perpetually happy. And Cain was judged almost 6,000 years ago. And he is perpetually damned. And in the gap between the judgment of the soul of Abel, which has happened almost 6,000 years ago, and the gap between the judgment of his body, which shall come at the end of the world, when Abel's body is risen from the dead along with everyone else, we will discover in the big scheme of things of eternity that it was a very small time. Not just a small time between my death and the judgment of the particular judgment when I die and the general judgment at the very end of the world, but the, the gap between the judgment of Abel and the judgment of Abel is such a small gap. We must remember that the time of this life is very short. The time of darkness is very short. The time of evil is very short. And we are all going to face a judgment. And if we go about our daily duty with the knowledge and love of God in our hearts, and whatever day the judgment comes, it's a good day. And if we go about our life not thinking of God, remember, remember the Dives. Dives did not commit impurities. Dives always went to church on the Sabbath. Dives was not guilty of any major guilty sin. He had nothing to confess when he went to confession. And Dives burns in hell. And why does he burn in hell? Because outside of his house, where he was a wealthy man, there was a poor man named Lazarus, and he neglected him. What was the word of Cain in order to avoid his own judgment? Where is thy brother Abel? Am I my brother's keeper? You shall be judged about your brother. I shall be judged about my brother. All of us shall be judged about our brothers. And this is made clear in the first judgment of God of the condemnation of Cain on the occasion of the judgment of God of the glory of Abel, whose blood cried to heaven. There shall be vengeance. And you must remember this dogma of our church that is an infallible truth my body shall rise from the dead. When consecrated a bishop only a few months ago, he was asked about, do you, Joseph Pfeiffer, believe in the faith? Do you believe in the blessed trinity? Do you believe in all the doctrines of the faith? And the very last question of the bishop consecrated me, he said, do you, Joseph Pfeiffer, do you believe that this body that you are carrying with you right now, this physical body, do you believe that this body shall rise at the last day and stand before the judgment seat of God? Not just in general that everyone's going to rise from the dead. I kneel in front of the Blessed Sacrament in this chapel and was asked, Do you believe that your physical body, the very one you are in right now, 
After it dies, it shall be taken up again, and it shall stand before the judgment seat of God in the valley of Josephat at the end of the world on the day of judgment. Credo. I believe. Then we proceed to the consecration. We must remember <clears throat> that our faith is personal. Your body is going to rise from the dead, the very one that is here in this church. It is going to be carried to the valley of Josephat. It is going to be judged on the last day. We do not believe just the first 11 articles of the creed. We believe all 12 articles, and they are all 12 true. And today we consider the 12th article of the creed, that God is going to judge the living and the dead. Those that are alive in grace and those that are dead in grace. Those that are alive on that last day and those that are already dead on that last day. All shall be judged. So let us prepare for the judgment. And remember that the preparation of the judgment is not made tomorrow, but made today. Let's live in grace and love of God today. And remember that we are the brother's keeper. And the enemies that despise us and attack us and are against us who hold the true faith. They shall meet the judgment in their own due time. Don't worry. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I shall repay. And he shall also repay the justice <clears throat> that is inside of us. There will be a day of judgment. No one shall escape it. Let us prepare well for it. And we'll leave it at that. And God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.